The Get Down is brought to you by Digital Music Pool. Digital Music Pool is the ultimate record pool for professional DJs looking for the hottest tracks and exclusive hits updated daily in an easy to use platform. You can find exclusive edits from myself, Cream, Adam B., Andrew Marks, Angelo the Kid, Armin Averro, Chumpian, Dan FX, Castra, Pat C., and Samus J. only on DMP. And we're giving you a chance to try their service for just $9.99 for the first month. All you have to do is click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down or Cream Instagram pages, create an account, and enter the promo code CREAM at checkout for your discounted month. DMP is my go-to record pool for new and exclusive music to play in my sets. So become a member for just $9.99 for the first month with the code CREAM and check it out for yourself. Click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down or Cream Instagram pages to sign up now. You will not be disappointed. If you love listening to The Get Down, you will love the video version of our show on YouTube even more. With all new audio and video upgrades, we've taken the show to the next level. On YouTube, you get to see our facial expressions, hand gestures, and real passion we have for this industry and for helping you grow your DJ business. Click the link in the show notes or on the Get Down Instagram page to watch the podcast now or search Get Down DJs on YouTube. We would greatly appreciate if you subscribe to our channel, like, and comment any questions you might have that we could bring up on the show. On this episode of the Get Down Podcast, our guest is Chris Kinzel, managing partner of Downtown Social New York City. Chris has been a bartender, manager, and now owner in nightlife and brings a unique perspective to our show. What really stands out about Chris is the second to none hospitality provided to not only customers, but entertainers and why that's such an important aspect to their brand and business. We discuss his transition from manager to managing partner, his move to New York City, venue rebrand, and how he helped transform Downtown Social into what it is today. Finally, we dive into what it's like to be a venue owner and understand the many overlooked costs of owning and running a venue and how it affects DJs and entertainment. We hope you enjoy this behind-the-scenes look at the nightlife industry from an owner's perspective. Let's get into this episode of The Get Down with Chris Kinzel. What's up, guys? Welcome to the 137th episode of The Get Down, brought to you by Digital Music Pool. My name is Cream. Gary W. here. We have another guest today, and it's someone... We have these conversations every single week, so we it was only right for us to bring it to the podcast. Welcome, Chris Kinzel, Managing Partner, Downtown Social, among other titles. <laughs> What's up, Chris? <laughs> What's going on, guys? How are you? Good. We're doing good. Man. But you know what? This is going to be, I woke up this morning and I'm like, this is going to be an easy conversation. This is something that we do anyway, all the time. We're probably connected with you most out of every manager or bar owner that we deal with. Um, we like your involvement, obviously. We'll get into why we like your involvement. And uh, I think it's going to be a really good conversation for people to hear not only you know your thoughts on the industry and and kind of the direction where the industry is going right now but also to get a little behind the scenes conversation of what we talk about on a weekly anyway and maybe it'll change people's perspective on you know how they think they need to get booked how they need to act at a venue so on and so forth yep you know positive or negative i really enjoy looking forward to that monday or tuesday phone call with you guys um we always get something great out of that and uh, I'm excited to get it on the record today. Yeah, I think another another this is your your perspective is going to be great because Gary and I come on here and we just murder venues and venue owners sometimes, but because of like <laughs> just their lack of involvement or it, it's been like an ongoing thing on the pod. I know you listen, so you hear us go on our mini rants. But every time we talk about a positive business owner and someone who runs a venue, Chris is generally the person we're talking about. And downtown social is generally, he's, it's like one of a few venues that we, when we do talk positively about how things are run, it's generally about downtown social or a handful of other venues we work with. So you guys are pretty good about keeping it anonymous. So we try. Yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> 
So um, we, we actually met, like, you know, we're all working together here in New York, but we actually met. So you're a Jersey guy that was transplanted down to Charleston, and we met in Charleston through Angelo, right? Is that, is that real? Is that right? Yeah, we did. So they'll make it quick. I was running a college bar in uh, Charleston. I was a junior in college and grew up in Belmore, New Jersey. So I was friends with a lot of, you know, headliner DJs, Porter guys. I worked at Headliner for a while. And I saw these like Angelo edits starting to pop up everywhere. And I would play them at the bar. He'd be sending me music. We'd be messaging each other back and forth on Instagram. I was like, come play a headlining set on a Saturday for me down in Charleston. You can stay on my couch. Just get a flight. We'll take care of you. Never heard him DJ before. And uh, he hopped down. We had the conversation afterwards. His mixes were great, but I'd never heard him live. He could have been awful. So that was a big gamble (laughs) on on my part. Um, He crushed it. He fell in love with Charleston just like I did. And then shortly after, I believe you guys came down. And that's where we shook hands for the first time. Yeah, Yeah, one of his next trips, right? I want to see that. And then you guys got some gigs. You just hopped on. And then, yeah. That venue was great. It was like a bar. But like it's it had like a little like a little step up in production, so like it made it attractive for somebody like an Angelo to come down. It had the Chris touches his, that we now know. It, did. it had the Chris right. touches. It, had, touches. it did. It had the Jersey touches, is, is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, that that venue is we we liked hanging out there. We thought it was like this nice little step up. It reminds us reminded us of one of our current venues in Hoboken, just with an elevated feel. Um, so that was kind of that was a that was a. And it was cool to see you behind the bar and interacting with the crowd and doing all the things that you do really well now, just as a bartender. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, creating a show and creating an atmosphere for the, for the crowd there. And it was like kind of eye opening. Like we don't have bartender. We don't, I don't deal with many bartenders that do that, you know, and, and, and take that next step um, to make it a good experience. It was fun. I don't get to do it behind the bar too much. I try to do it on the floor as much as I can. I think that's why I get so excited when I get to talk to you guys. I'm like, nice, I'm in it again. <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong. That trip was your introduction to 13 Step and Hair of the Dog? I believe I think, so. I, I think, want to say I you think we met some of our partners down south and they connected you to New York. Yeah, we were hanging out at uh, Uptown. Yep in Charleston and we ended up meeting Bryn and some of the other partners and kind of just hit it off. Angelo was introducing to us to people. You were introducing us to people and just kind of talking about what we do up here. And that was how we started working with best bars and 13th step and hair of the dog in New York city. So it's crazy. Like that was one of those networking trips and it was like, let's go to a new city. Let's go hang out with Angelo. Let's go meet some people. And so much came out of that trip. My relationship with Eric at Trio came out of that trip. Our relationship with you, our relationship with Best Bars, it's kind of crazy. Like one weekend, how much came out of that that one trip? And that was supposed to be a little vacation weekend for you guys. Yeah, it was COVID. Nothing was open up by us. We were like, F it. Let's just go down. Let's go check out Charleston. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, Crazy. Doing that weekend didn't feel like work at all. You know, that that networking was just easy. It was in the in the, what we would have been doing on quote unquote vacation anyway. Right. We were just hanging out and, and meeting people anyway. So like, it, it was just a natural thing. It didn't feel like a work trip. I think that trip made me realize that it's okay to go and do that. And like, I went to Charlotte recently and I'm going to go probably go down to Austin at some point in this year in 2024 to go meet with some of those guys, CRG and some of the other DJs. And it's like, yeah, you're losing out on the money for the weekend, but those relationships are so valuable. And you never really know what can happen from, from that little trip. So super valuable. We talked right, about so it go ahead, quick, bad. Struggle, Like, do we keep our guys in New York and Jersey? Do we let them fly? Do we, you know, Angelo did it and Angelo is kind of now under neither of us, but he's crushing it. Yeah. So it's nice to see those guys grow and, you know, get to the Charleston's, get to the Austin's, get to the Nashville's. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's something we talk about trying to move our, some of our DJs to different markets. And, you know, you've you've helped facilitate some of that. And that's definitely a goal of many of our DJs is to go play other markets. So any way that we can help facilitate that is, is a is a win, you know? Yeah. All right. So I, I, we talked a little bit about how we met. I want to fast forward. So you left Charleston. You came up to New York because you had an opportunity to become a managing partner at one of the venues, one of the best bar venues. 
And that's really how we started working together. So you used to work, uh, I'm sorry, you, you took over a spot called 13th Step. It was one of the venues we were booking for a while. The DJ booth was in a closet. The sound was not very good. Our DJs didn't really want to work there. They just work there because we put them there type of thing. And in a year, you've sort of transformed 13 Step into what is now Downtown Social, which is a place where every one of our DJs want to work. We have upgraded sound, staging, upgraded lighting. We're popping confetti. Like so much has changed in such a short period. And clearly it's changed since you've come up here. So talk a little bit about what your expect expectations were coming up to New York and sort of how you implemented your vision to create downtown social. It, uh, it's humbling to hear when you put it that way. And I, disclaimer, it was a team effort. You know, yes, did those changes happen when I moved up? Yeah, no questions asked. But there was already a management team. There was already an operating partner at the 13th step. And we had full um, backing from our partners down in Charleston, which we pulled a lot of, um, pulled a lot of these elements from. Um, so when I came to New York, I, I honestly didn't really know what to expect. Um, I was a Jersey guy, but I never didn't spend time in the city. Wasn't too fond of it. Um, one day I had a conversation in Charleston. It's basically like, I want to be a partner in this company. And Keith Benjamin, um, one of our senior operators down South was like, all right, let me think about it. Came back to me a week later. He goes, you'll make partner, but you got to move to New York city. And I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> um, so we came in and we came in, we did, you know, we did some renovations at the 13th step. Uh, we, like we said, we upgraded our sound system. We put a video wall in. So we had the elements there, but I don't think anyone really knew how to use them, including myself. So it was a learning lesson through that. We had lights installed, but we soon, le we soon learned that, you know, they're not programmed the right way. Or we had a video wall, but we're not using it the right way. We have a DJ booth, but... We're not using it the right way. Um, so the first couple months was really spent me looking at the elements and the opportunity we have and how do we just capitalize on it across the board. Um, so it was all new for me, for the, the partners and the managers at Downtown Social was the 13th step. And just every day figuring out how can this be bigger, better, more fun. Um, you know, I say I want people to walk in here and just say, what the hell is going on? You know, <laughs> New York City, I think. It's so crazy sometimes for these big clubs and people expect that. But to walk into a basement bar, um, listen to a band playing, and then the room blacks out, and then you have just strobes and confetti and loud music. It's something different. Was that the like was that kind of the mission statement from the team? I, I don't know if there if there was like a mission statement and a uh and and kind of a, a goal, a main goal of like where the company wanted to be or where the bar wanted to be. Um was that kind of the mission statement? Like we we're going to like, we're going to really lean into this nightlife, like almost like nightclub sort of feel. So this sounds cliche. Our mission statement was to have a fun bar and throw a good party. Um, a lot of that I think was put into my hands when I moved here. Um, my, the upper management of our company had seen what I'd done at the college bar that you guys were talking about before. They'd seen what I've done at some of the, um, our bars down South in Charleston that are part of this company. And, you know, applaud to them. They kind of, they had faith. They, you know, they got me a plane ticket to New York and said, you know, good luck. We have your I support. Let us, know, let us know what you need. But we've seen you do this before. Um, yeah. Like you said, Kareem, have at it. And it comes with its hurdles. You know, big city that I didn't spend much time in. Um, working with people that I've, I've met, you know, the day before. Um, yeah. So we, we just went for it. Which was kind of cool. It just what happened was what New York wanted. You know, our customers came in and we realized what they wanted more and more every weekend, and we just adapted to that. So you guys are in the what is that? That's considered the East Village, right? Cool, yeah. Um, so like, there's really nothing like what you guys offer in that area, and it's such a young. It, it's been a, a thriving area of New York City for you know twenty some young twenty somethings that are moving into the city for the first time. Um, it's shocking that there was nothing offered like that because I lived down there that down in 2000 from 2009 to 2011. And th like you had cocktail bars, speakeasies, things like that, dive bars that you could walk into, but it was, there was no party, like real party scene that you're going to walk into and there's gonna be loud music, dim lights and 
you know, you could really, really party. Like you would have to actually go to a major nightclub for that. So you guys really created something niche in your in your market. A question I was going to have before this was how much how much like onus did you guys put in on the sound system? Something that Cream and I talk about all the time that we feel is so important. And I feel like that's something that's missing in so many places. Um, so how important did you and the team feel like the sound was to your success? So when we first opened, we did a full light uh, revamp. The sound actually didn't change too much to start uh, within – I think a month of opening um, the back rooms that we have, which is about half of our space. We completely revamped sound. Um, we do live bands as well. So we, you know, QSEs were installed, subs were installed. We flipped a handful of speakers. Um, this is my ignorance to how AV works here, but not too much sound was changed. I think it's the way it was utilized. Also, uh, we, I, I remember, you know, before you came up, Lloyd, Lloyd, who's one of the other partners that we work with, shout to Lloyd, love him. He, he also, they, there was some sound done uh, prior to you getting there. So we, we yeah. had upgraded the sound prior to you getting there. And then, uh, you know, you guys, you came in and just kind of tweaked it for the performance aspect for sure. But I, in talking to Lloyd, he, he's like, I know the sound sucks. We need, we need sound. We need sound. We need sound. And me and Gary would always be like, yeah, you do. <laughs> it's going to make a huge difference. And I think that was like the first, that was the first step in taking 13th step to downtown, like just from a, a DJ's perspective and from our perspective as bookers, you know, once you invest in some sound, it's like, all right, these guys are serious about doing nightlife kind of thing. You know, they're not just a bar that's going to try to put a DJ on. They're trying to do nightlife, which there's a big difference between those two things. Yeah, you know, and little things like putting a monitor in the booth. I know it sounds so small or just knowing how that works or, um, you know, our bands play and all the speakers on stage turn off. So there's no feedback like those little tiny things. And we learned that, like I said, weekly. And we were just constantly changing for the first six months, um, specifically for myself, working with Lloyd, who's a senior partner here in New York. He's been great. I'll, I'll come to him after the weekend and be like, this needs to be fixed. Um, I don't have the power to do it in our company. Lord will be like, great, I'm writing a check. What do we need to do? <laughs> what do we need to pay? And if anyone has any questions, tell them to come talk to me. Um, I feel so like Lloyd is like the most calm, collected dude ever. Every, I've never seen him like get yeah. upset or angry or loud. Or <laughs> I'll come to him and be like, oh, this, this happened. And he's like, right, how do we address it? Let's go for it. So we even Yeah, he's, he's great to work with. Uh, but no, to, to, to recap that for the sound, um, it was important to us. We knew if it sounded good, if it didn't sound good, um, we weren't afraid to put money into it. And we went from there. We're still changing. You know, every week we're texting our AV guys, having them come in, tweak things. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the AV as well. I mean, you're only what, 11 months, 12 months now in? We are a year in January. A year in January. Wow. It's incredible. Like you guys rebranded and were successful immediately. Yep. You know, like lying around the block like, uh, immediately. I just had, how, how do you think you guys were so successful so fast? Or why do you think you were so su successful so fast? So we, you were talking about before how there's not much of what we do in the East village. There's not much in the East village period. Um, you know, you walk down the second Ave on a Thursday, Friday night, You'll hit us. You'll hit a cocktail bar. It's really it. And, you know, we have bars that border either side of us. And, you know, we'll have work capacity, 200 people in line. And these bars to the left and right of us have 15 people in them. Um, so people are hopping in their Ubers and taxis to come to us. Uh, we generally don't do a cover charge. Drinks are reasonable. Um, you can have fun and party. You know, it's not no bar minimums, no real strict dress code. Let's just have people come have a good time. They feel safe. Um, and it checks all those boxes. Not for everybody. That's, that's the formula that customers are looking for right now. They're not looking for the $20 cover. I have to wear a dress shirt, no hats, $25 vodka sodas. Like people, they don't want that right now. And, and customers are telling the, the market that they don't want that. And if you're doing that, you're most likely not that successful right now, especially in the state of our economy and how things are going. So I think 
having that outlook and that kind of, uh, I don't know, understanding of what your customers really want is a testament to like what, you know, what you guys are doing and, and your understanding, uh, your understanding of your customer base and the market and all the things that are go into having a successful spot. What do you, yeah, it goes back just, to, just for reference, back like what's a, what's like a double vodka soda cost? This is how I gauge everything now. What's a double <laughs> vodka soda cost? Uh, a single would be nine. Uh, a double would be just shy of 18. Um, yeah. All right. As long as you're not in the twenties, I feel like you're all right. <laughs> all day, every day you can do $5 beers. Uh, we do $5 seltzers, you know, on a Saturday night, you want to get a bucket of seltzers. It's 25 bucks. That's yeah, incredible. like that's gold. Or you can get a Cosmico I, I, Auto double and it's, you know, in the mid twenties and you can feel bad and bougie and try to impress the people and they're fine. Yeah. I bought a $13 high noon the other day, $13 yep. for one high noon. I was like, what, what? I thought they were fucking where with was, me. Where was that? At one of our venues in Hoboken. Jesus Christ. Yeah, don't call them out. <laughs> Something we discussed that we'll potentially talk about today is the cost of doing business. Um, I think I know you guys talk specifically a lot about the music industry in these venues. Um, I would like to touch at some point about what what the cost of doing business is. You know, people see lines around the block and, you know, crazy parties on Fridays and Saturday nights, but they don't realize what goes into us. And that thirteen dollar high noon, you know, helps a lot of these places run. Yeah, no, sure. I, let's get into it right now. I mean, I think this is a great transition. I think this is the part of the business that most people have no idea about. And they don't understand what it costs to run a place and why things are so expensive right now. So let's let's jump into it right now. So yes, what you know, are, yeah, like what are what are some of the things that that the regular person would overlook? You know, to start with payroll, minimum wage in New York City is fifteen dollars an hour. Um and a step above that is the what it costs to live in New York City. So these employees that we have, you know, fifteen dollars an hour seems high for minimum wage um, generally. But then on top of what we actually have to pay these people is is astronomical. Um, you know, put fifteen security guards, ten bartenders, two managers on the floor on top of entertainment, um, it adds up. Four guys in the kitchen until one a.m. five nights a week. Um, that gets overlooked. You know, that's a big number. Rent is a huge number. Uh, call, what cost of product is. We just did a big uh, a plumbing project at Downtown Social. You know, that's, you know, in the f- a five-digit project. We're going to replace some air conditioning units soon. Like, this stuff adds up. Um, you do two or three or four big R&M projects, that's your month in sales gone. Right. Uh, but you have to do those things. When you're working in a, you know, 100-year-old building, it, it needs attention. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, we talk about this constantly. We talk about the cost of, we just say we, we pretty, we yourself. get pretty general. We get pretty general in, in saying that like our market sometimes struggles with like the little things like the sound and the lighting and maybe not having a video wall because, well, because ownership needs to invest in so much other stuff. I mean, and then just your rent alone is putting you far behind many other smaller markets where their rents aren't as high. Let's talk about like a Charleston where I'm sure they're that, you know, a place of the similar size in New York city is like 50 grand is, which is 50 grand in Charleston's probably more like five or 10 grand. So like you're talking about completely, completely different. We shit on our market constantly. You know, we do it all the time. Like, Oh, we went to Charleston. It was amazing. Hospitality was great. They had video walls and the sound was great and CO2 machines. And it's like, well, yeah, because that five thousand dollar a month rent is a lot different than the fifty grand it is in New York City, yep. um, and we do it constantly. So I'm, I'm I'm happy that you're here to shed light a little bit on the specifics of outside of rent. What else is 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 costing so much? You know, little things like people look at our industry and say, "Great, there's a DJ, and these people bought beer two hours ago and opened their doors, and they're going to close until next Friday." And that's you know that's not how it works. Who does your marketing? Who's your lawyer? Who does your payroll? Who does your HR? Who's, you know, who works in your corporate offices? Like these huge things. Who books your parties? You know, there's 10 people right there who don't even work in our building but are on our payroll. Yeah. And people don't see that. I'll never forget the time that I emailed Lloyd and I'm like, so just give me your accountant's, um, give me your accountant's information. He's like, accountant? It's like, I do the accounting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a fucking accountant. <laughs> 
Well, that's like us, Gary. We we do all those. We have all those people. It's you and me. <laughs> you ha- you have to figure out ways to cut costs where you can in order to invest money into other parts of your business to yep. make your business successful, right? And 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 a lot of small and you guys aren't a small business. I mean, you own you own a ton of uh, different venues, um, but you still it still needs to happen where you, you do cut those costs where you can. Yeah. You know, little things like adding a security guard on a Friday night, like that adds up. Yeah. Let alone adding three, four, five security guards because business requires it. Yeah. Right, because that's so coming how- right out of your, your profit, right? Like that's just off the top pretty much. Yeah, but, it, you know, it's essential. You know, right, because if there's a huge fight and someone gets really hurt and, you know, that gets out into the world, then maybe you don't have lines around the block anymore. And, yeah. you know, that's 75 or 100 hours or whatever a security guard costs. It's like, all right, in the grand scheme of things, like we should have just paid the the cost yeah, of the employee. Kind of thing. You know, and knock on wood, um, I'm, I'm proud to say we're, you know, a safe space. I walk into bars and clubs and I'm like, I'm grabbing my girlfriend and I'm putting my hands in my pockets because – I don't know if I'm going to walk out of here with my phone or wallet or not. Right. Um, and I've never felt that way in, you know, really any of our establishments. I mean, I, I want to say new, this, but I don't want to jinx anything. But like in all the time that I've been there, I've never seen one fight ever. And I've yeah, been there a lot. A couple tussles here and there, but generally speaking, we don't see much. Yeah. So, so we uh, talked about you being a, a, a bartender. Um, so I, how has that transition from bartender to partner given you – has it given you a deeper appreciation of what it takes to run a place? Did you kind of know that already, like what it took to run a, a, a venue? In all my time um, bartending and managing down in Charleston, I was really forward-facing. Um, so everything I did was just customer involvement. Rarely did I metaphorically open that office door. Um, so yes, moving to New York as, as my appreciation for what happens in the back of the house has grown exponentially. If you, if you knew what you know now, would you still have gotten into it? Yeah, probably more so. Um, really? It's just tools I'm gaining, you know, it's like my tool chest and I'm just adding a tool every week. You know, what can I learn today? What do I know today that I did not know yesterday and how can we change it? And how can I add a different perspective to it? You know, little things like how are we doing our schedules? Um, How are we booking? How are we following up with our booking agents? So Nice. You obviously have a deep passion for for the nightlife business, for the bar business. Um, And it it shines through, through just just the way you communicate with us, we could tell. You know what I mean? Um, But sometimes people change roles in in nightlife like you did go from bartender to a partner and sometimes like the shine will wear off and it's like well i don't this isn't going to be for me long term yep. you know do, do you feel like it's this is something long term for you like you, this is going to be your career for a very long time this is 110 percent my career yeah uh my goal is to open as many spots as we can um similar to what we have maybe five times the size with a rooftop um we have such a good team um, Keith Benjamin, like I mentioned before, talks a lot about he's the one who runs Uptown Social and all of our operations in Share House in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Building our bench, um, it it's great to have one or two people at the top, but who's below you? Who's going to take over when you're not there? Or you're sick or you're on vacation? Um, and some people could look at it and say, "Hey, you know, why do you have ten people on your bench?" when they could be all-stars running a spot right now? And the answer is because I'm going to have five all-star, all-star, all-star teams in yeah. a year. And when yeah. I can move those 10 people from my bench to now have five huge spots, uh, that's the goal. Definitely. Because, because, yeah, you're right. When you're not there, somebody else needs to step up because you do such a great job with – and I'd like to transition into hospitality. You do such a great job with hospitality – with not only the patrons, but your entertainment as well. And if that's how you are with your patrons and your entertainment, I'm sure you're amazing with your staff, you know, also. Um, so I, when you leave, it, it is so, so, so important to have somebody else to fill that role, right? Because you don't want downtown social to feel completely different when Chris Kinzel's not there. 
Yeah. You know, that's been a big struggle for me because I enjoy it so much. So when I'm there, I want to be, you know, want to be that guy engaging with our entertainment. I want to be that guy really pushing to throw the party. Um, being able to take a step back and, you know, let some of the other managers and staff come into that role. It's easy to do when I'm not there, right? Because they have no choice. But for me to step back and watch someone else engage with you too, it's like I have FOMO. So I, I work for myself every day. I'll have conversations with my managers, you know, before shifts saying, what's your goal today? What can you learn? What can I step back and, and give to you to take care of tonight that I haven't done previously? Yeah, I think that's the growth of being an owner and being like a, a business owner, right? And not just, not just a DJ, but also a business owner, not just a bartender or a manager, but a business owner is being able to kind of pass your vision and some of your skills on to the next person and then be able to give them the responsibility and let them do it. And, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to do that. I'm the first one that wants to jump in there as well and be like, well, no, you should do it this way. But I think it's so important in being a leader to kind of let, when, when you give someone a responsibility, you let them do it, you know, and then you could kind of talk about it afterwards and say, Hey, I might've done this here or Hey, you did a great job in this way, I would have never done it that way. I, you know, I love that. I learned something from you. Um, but I think it's really important to let, to let those people go and do, you know, do the job and, and get the experience. And the more they do it, the better they're going to get at it. And eventually they're going to be able to do it almost as well as you can do it. In my, my partner and I, Lloyd talk about this pretty often. He's kind of, he, he's giving me the reins um, when it comes, you know, to the party that we're throwing. And there's plenty of times, more often than I'm sure he'll say, that he would have loved to step in and say, whoa, this is not the right choice. But if he didn't let me make that mistake, there'd be no learning opportunity and I wouldn't grow. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, the customers really don't see any of that. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's not, it's not a big deal. Um, but it's huge for our, our track and our learning career. Yeah. What you guys do, and it's not just at downtown, but at all the venues that I've been to that, that your group owns and runs, your hospitality towards the entertainment is better than any other venue that we work in. It, and honestly, like I want to share what you guys do with all the other venues that I work at, because as an, as a DJ, you know, feeling that love, the t-shirts, I'm wearing a t-shirt. It's one of the probably 10 t-shirts you've given me in the last six months. And a sign that just welcomes me. You ask, you know, what, what the DJs that we send in there want to drink and you'll set them up with a bucket of high noons or whatever. It's all like little things, but it all adds up to creating an atmosphere and an environment that entertainers want to be in. And when you have an entertainer that wants to be in a venue, they're going to give you their best. They're going to do the best job that they can do. They're going to prep a little harder. They're going to promote a little harder. And it, it just creates this atmosphere of success. And I don't think many people who run venues understand that. And I don't understand why uh, it's something that goes overlooked. But why is that something that's so important to you and the rest of your team? You know, it's, we talk about this on a weekly basis, and I almost think it's funny because I don't feel like we're doing anything, and it's not, and none of this is hard. Um, the answer why it's important to me is I just enjoy it. Um, I enjoy texting the DJ, you know, a couple days before, be like, "Hey, just found this song. I love this song. I'd love for you to play this." Or, "What are you opening to? Who are you bringing?" Uh, they'll show up. We have, you know, we have a pretty standard DJ booth, maybe, you know, even below standard compared to some of these bigger clubs. Um, but they come in, there's a little note. It's like a hype note. Be like, like, you know, let's F and go. Let's crush it tonight. Um, there'll be a shirt or a hat, which we only have so many shirts. So we're starting to like, like I can only give you the same shirt so many times <laughs> um, and just making them feel important. You know, they walk up. I'm excited to see them. We'll take care of them. We'll get some drinks for them. Maybe we'll take a shot together. Um, that's really it. And it's just being present and communicating what I'm looking for in the night. It's it, like cream said, it's one of the only venues. It is the only venue that we deal with that goes above and beyond in that way. And I feel like the only time we ever hear from ownership about the DJ is when something goes wrong. Right. 
there's not there's there's not enough communication with like hey that dj did a great job or like it's like okay well something went wrong we have to cut the pay for this reason or that reason right and i feel like that's a lot of the communication that's not the right way to lead a company that is hiring you know hiring out all of these different positions you know being negative all the time is never never great and then so when you're doing those things and then let's say a dj does have an off night that monday conversation is way easier because you know what you did your job you took care of you took care of the talent you made sure they felt at home you know and you know that that monday conversation really if it if i wasn't happy you know cream if you're playing and i don't think your set was the best we'll talk about it i'll be like you know why was this not the best can we right. look at your set? You know, where, were the BPM super high or super low all night? How did you open? Did you not open hard For enough? For the record, we have not had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> He's lying. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> but just an, anal, it's analyzing what happened, not just, yeah. oh, we had a, a crappy night and this DJ sucks and let's not have him back. I'm like, it was pouring rain and you didn't promote your night and you didn't say a word to your DJ. Like, no questions asked. You didn't have a good night, right? Yeah, right. I I think so many times management or ownership will just go and look at the numbers and just blame it on the entertainment. And you know, there's so many other factors that are involved. Um, like you said, you know, wet weather, especially in the last two months, being a, a major one in the New York City area. We had our first um, dry weekend last weekend. One other thing too that I, I don't know if if. Chris loves the music. He understands the value of the DJ. I don't think a lot, not all the venues and the managers and the people that run these places value the DJ. They look at it like, oh, this guy gets to come here. He gets paid a lot of money or she gets paid a lot of money. They get to drink on the job. Meanwhile, they're getting a manager's salary and they're dealing with drunk people and a bunch of staff that doesn't really care to be there that much. And it's like, I think a lot of times there's like some hate towards the DJ and you, you can feel that in the communication with the venues sometimes or, oh, well, I could just, if this, if cream doesn't work out, I could just hire another DJ. But then the next, the next weekend, your, you know, your overall numbers are $10,000 less and they want to know why kind of thing, you know? So we always say it all the time. You can't have it both ways. You can't shit on the DJ and say that they're spoiled and they get paid too much money. But then when you have a bad night, blame the DJ, like... Yeah, right. So I think you you value the DJ and, and understand the music, and I don't. I think that is in the minority, to be honest. What do you guys think about that? I mean, you you, 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 you lived it though that. because you you care about it so much, and you're in every venue you've worked cares about the DJ. So that's all you know. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Gary and I deal with so many other places that they don't know the difference between Taylor Swift and Calvin and Calvin Harris, or like I don't. It's a bad example, but like. They don't know the music. They don't care. Well, Chris, my question is, do, is the music that like Angelo plays is kind of the direction that we went to in downtown social, right? Are you a fan of that? Are you consuming that music pretty regularly? Or are you a fan of like completely something else? Different? I, was, just know I that listen that's to works. country music all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's I mean, enlightening. Like, and at least you go to work and you're not like, well, now we got to play country music today. No, I mean, at, at, Two thirty in the morning, I'll come up to Cream and be like, "Let's let's get some country edits going." Let's, let's <laughs> it up a little bit. No question. Um, look, I hear I hear this music, you know, four days a week, louder than I would like to, um, and I, I know every word to every song. But if you ask me what the track idea on any of these songs are, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering that because I feel like when I'm dealing with a lot of uh, managers and owners, it's like they request the stuff that they personally like. And it's not the stuff that's going to tra- that doesn't always translate well in the venue. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like you're requesting this genre that is way off base, but then you're like being adamant about like having it played now just because you own the place. Like it, it doesn't make sense, you know? And that's why I was wondering, I'm like, okay, well maybe Chris is just a big fan and that's why it just works. No, like you're actually doing your job. You know, what's going to work in the room and that's what you, that's what you're striving for. We talk about pretty often, the three of us, in our, you know, weekly talks. I don't know how to describe a lot of this music, but I know how to describe the feel. And when (laughs) I'm in my venue and I'm just like, yes, like I'm just happy. I'm have like the party is on. That's the direction I'm going for. Um, 
and I think that's how we've gotten to a lot of the musical direction that we push a lot of our DJs to go. Like, how do we get to that? <clears throat> um, yeah. And you guys have been super helpful in that in, in figuring out what that genre is. I I, want to at say first it was it tough. Yeah, because, you know, and I know I maybe wasn't easy about it, but if, if I didn't have that feeling, you guys would know. Right. Um, right. It's a lot of pressure because when you don't know what I'm looking for, uh, it's a lot of trial and error, but I feel like we're in a good spot. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's been definitely. fun to sort of curate the rooms with you and not just the front room because yeah. the front room is one thing, right? We're going for this kind of happy, up-tempo, vocals people know, EDM drops type front room vibe. And we open the back room and when we the week before we opened it, you know, we all had this conversation of like, well, what should the back room be? And we were like, should it be like deep house? Should it be hip hop? Should it be open format? And we kind of had this conversation. And then we had the first weekend, the DJs kind of played a certain way. And then we had another conversation. It's like, well, let's tweak it a little this way. Maybe we should do more of this or less of this. And I think having that open conversation made all the difference. And it's been so valuable to get your feedback, to be able to pass it to the DJs. And then once I then go there, I get to implement what we've talked about and it's been like this really good kind of circle of trust here yeah um i've learned a lot through this too it's gotten to the point that i'll go up to the guys playing um it's you know now i'm friends with them um and i'll say this isn't working or here's what we expect tonight or what can the plan be and it doesn't have to wait till monday it can be you know at midnight on a saturday night when i go talk to this guy and be like look i know you see 10 people engaged but the other 200 people in the room are not so we need to go a different direction. And they appreciate it because they, they want to have a good night, right? They want the venue to do well and for us to be happy. Yeah, and I'm that sure conversation is, that it. conversation is easy. It's just how it's how you have the conversation. It's the approach, yeah. It's the approach for sure. Gary, I'm sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. No, because we, you know what? We, have, we do have managers and owners that aren't as personable, which is so strange. You're managing people. They're managing bartenders and, and, and bouncers and things like that. And they're like, their approach to most conversations is very harsh. And then remember, I remember we talked about this, Chris, months ago. And it was like, just go tell them to change it. Just make the approach easy. You know, don't be like, this sucks. Nobody's, nobody likes it. Like, because you're hearing that from every drunk white girl anyway. So like, you know, you don't want to hear that from management. You know, you just go up and be like, hey, listen, like this isn't working out and this is why. And let's, let's go somewhere else. And the guys will be very, very cool about it. It's when they get yelled at and they feel attacked, and then it's it's a it's a little bit of a different story. If what the can, fuck is this? Why what are you playing right now? Right, like, there's been so right. many, so many, so many negative quick, quick little anecdotes. DJs are scarred. DJs are scarred from that, yep. those negative approaches. I'm scarred from those negative approaches over the years. When I was 18 at uh, working at one of the clubs that I was at, just bar backing, dreams and nightmares came on, and when I say one of the managers was fuming. <laughs> outside of his ears and like yelled at the DJ. And I was like, my like ignorant 18 was like, I love this song. What is this? So this is cool. It was not the direction they were going. Um, obviously there was a um, miscommunication there, but Gary, back to the point where you were saying, we get a little icebreaker to start. So it's not a hard conversation that f- for me to have with our entertainment. Um, right. DJ comes in. I talk about how we're going to transition from the band to the DJ, I ask them to turn their monitor down. I get my levels from the stage. I'll tap them on the shoulder 10 seconds later when they're ready to kick their monitor. So that rapport between me and the DJ starts before his set even starts. Um, if we yeah, I mean, generally you're that, asking for the DJ's number if they've never been in your room. So you could reach out to them and like say, hey, what's up? Or, you know, do you need anything? Or, hey, can you be here at this time? And I think that also goes a long way as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like we said, it's starting that conversation before the conversation needs to be had. Um, yeah. Again, easy stuff. It doesn't take much. So my, I have a question about like your format. We've curated like the sound in the front room and like would you be willing to change format like if the younger audience decides to like they're, they're going a different route in what they're interested in? You know, our – in the front, tell me if I'm wrong, we play pretty heavy sing-along house EDM, um, big room-ish. And then in the back rooms, there's no restrictions. 
I say you can go from Dreams and Nightmares to Mariah Carey back and forth 10 times if you want. <laughs> and what we found actually, and this is kind of new information to you guys, the back room has been staying busier longer than the front room has. Um, would I be willing to change? At the moment, I like where we're at. Um, that front room housey vibe is kind of our brand. And that is an yeah. introduction when people walk down those stairs, like they almost get slapped. It's like I just waited in line for 10 minutes and I walk into this room and I'm like, whoa. It's a, a switch, turns on them on. And if they go into the back room and start singing Christmas music, you know, in the middle of July, great. We offer yeah. that. <laughs> you know, there aren't, we, we've talked about this, cream in the past where, back, you know, when we were younger going out, like 18 to 22, like every place had two rooms. Like you had yeah, the, the house room and the, the hip hop room, mostly. The house room and the hip hop room, right? So, like, you'd go take a break and you'd jump between the two. I feel like your back room is an amazing opportunity for, your patrons to kind of get a break, right? Like, because they have so much energy in the front and you, you are, you have your sing-alongs and you're getting like banged over the head with drops and whatnot. And it's like, okay, well, let me go listen to a couple of hip hop songs or whatever they're playing in the back, you know, and just take a little break from, from that energy. Cause you can exhaust the crowd. We were just talking about this last week as I did it to a couple of my crowds during Halloween weekend where you can like just really run them, run them ragged where, and, and having that other room for them to go to is, is so unique and different these days. Um, and it's something that I miss about when I go out to, to a venue. Well, you know, talking about giving customers a break as well, I'll have DJs hit it hard at 11 o'clock and just hammer customers. And I love it, right? It's just like that, that oh feeling. But when people have that feeling too, they're not spending a ton of money. You know, when you're so engaged with the DJ – Cream, you, it's plenty of times. There'll be 45 people riding the rail 18 yeah. inches from your controller, and it's it's impeccable energy. And sometimes I need to come to the DJ and say, hey, like, let's pump the brakes a little bit. I look at the bar, and I got five bartenders standing there not making drinks, but a full room. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I see it sometimes where I'm like, all right, we got to take, take a TO here, and I'll go play like a really quick pop hip hop set or I'll go play a bad bunny track or I'll just go do some, or I'll play ABBA or I'll play dancing queen or Michael Jackson or just something random to kind of like break up the, the four on the floor banger mentality kind of thing. And I think that lower East side, like lower New York area, a lot of those other places, the style of music that's getting played is sort of what we're doing in the back room. So it's like super open format, bouncing around. You never really know what you're going to get. There's no rhyme or reason necessarily to, like you said, Christmas music to hip hop to Latin to EDA. Like it's just sort of random. But that's how a lot of these younger consumers and customers, that's how they consume music right now. It's like they listen to everything and they have Spotify and they can listen to Travis Scott and then they can listen to Avicii and then they can listen to a country song or whatever. And that's how people are consuming music. And I think that's why that format is, has been successful in the back room as well. You know, it's been so successful to the point that the DJs understand it as well. Um, I had a guy, a girl come up the other day. Uh, James was playing up front, and the girl holds up, you know, a bad bunny on her phone. And James is like, "Oh, go in the back room. They'll play whatever you want." <laughs> yeah, in the back room. He, told, he, told, he said that in the Discord. I was cracking up. That's awesome. Like, so send them, not, send them the back, send them the yeah. back. Yeah, but that's good because when people walk in your door, they have those two different vibes. And if they're not feeling that EDM vibe in the front. Instead of leaving, they're going to the back and they're still spending money in the building. And that's why having that separate room is so valuable because you're not losing customers. You're just giving them two different options, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's funny. People will walk back there after being up front for three hours and the look on their face is just like, like what's like, going on back here? What is this? <laughs> well, you know, it's been cool to see the transformation of the back room as well because there's a stage back there. We have dance floor lighting. It's really dark, you know? Like, people want to go dance and hang out in dark spaces. And it's just inviting for people to go party back there. It's like a... It's it's what a party goer wants. It's loud. It's dark. There's two bars. <laughs> like People want to go make decisions. No one's going to see them. They can do what they want. They can have fun, and they're not going to regret any of it. Yeah. 
which was a struggle. We had we had a hard time getting people back there for a while. You know, I, I have three bartenders back there that were putting no money in the register for a long time. And we finally dialed in what music should look like in the back. And it's paid off exponentially. You know what? It's That's such an um, important lesson here, if, especially if there's any other managers or owners listening. Like, you need patience. When you're trying something new, you really need patience. It's it's not going to instantly be packed on the first night of a new party. It's just, it's never going to happen. I mean, you guys had it a little bit when you opened Downtown Social. Um, so, yes, there are instances where you do get lucky. But when you're trying something new, so drastically new like that, like it's you can't expect success in the first week, two weeks, three weeks even. You just have to stick to it and tweak the areas that can keep that room or keep that idea open and available. Yep. Right. Cause you have to see it through because if you don't, if you don't do it and you just transition back to the, what, what you had before, it's just like, well, you're going to leave money on the table most of the time. Yeah. No, you know, the first couple months is going to be just trying out a, a bunch of different things. You know, 99% of it are not going to hit on top of that. You got staff behind you who's saying, why isn't this working? Why was the music like this tonight? And it's like everyone right, you just feel that pressure to, to have that instant success. Yeah. And uh, pressure because a lot of times people think the answer is just a different DJ or different music. Um, and if that was the answer overnight, we would have been doing that. Um, but it's really coming down to the format and what's the team that we want to put on this table to invest in our nights. Right. When you guys are having team meetings and obviously you're having, you know, goal meetings and things like that, how important is it to talk about like long-term success and long-term strategies for your business? Huge. You know, is, next- because I asked the question because it is such a like, a, we, we need to make money right now. So how, how do you, how do you kind of designate like, all right, these are the short-term goals. This is what we're willing to withstand if we want to try something in comparison to those long-term goals. You know, one of the biggest examples I bring up is, you know, we've been open not even a year yet, and we've we've seen a good amount of success. What happens when the place across the street that's vacant right now opens up, um, or the pop up around the block opens up for three months and is crushing it? You know, our competitors can see success just as fast as we have, um, and you know, talk about complacency. Complacency, you know, is our biggest enemy. The minute we say we're good today or let's just look at next week, uh, we fail. We fall because someone else is working 10 times harder than us to be successful in the long run. Yeah, that's a, it's the only way to look at it, really. How, that that so, work that you're that work, before we finish that work that you're yeah. putting in, you know, we, we have this conversation with almost every one of our guests. Right. It's all the work done behind the scenes that people don't see that help create what people do see, right? It's like all yep. the stuff that's happening behind the scenes, all the planning, all the meetings, all the late nights, and all the strategies and ideas, they start coming to fruition and the money starts coming and the success starts coming. And nobody sees all that stuff that you're doing every single day, maybe six months ago or a year ago, that now and today is paying off. So super the important. The amount of conversations I have with people and they're like, so what do you actually do? Or what do you do during the week when you're not working? Um, <laughs> funny to hear that perspective but that's reality like we said before people see us cranking on friday and saturday and then it's like we go on vacation monday to friday yeah i wish i had a so day off t- it'd be great <laughs> cream doesn't know how to take a day off that's 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 cream's problem it's a blessing <laughs> but it's also why you got <laughs> you're in now you know it, it, it speaks volumes and it's yeah true. So we, we talked about like your musical, like the music brand, like what, what people think of um, when they think downtown social from a music perspective. But like what are you guys doing from like a marketing, branding and social media side to kind of stay relevant, right? Because like in bar years, right, like five years and like you're out kind of a thing, right? So the best way really to, to stay relevant outside of all the other things that we talked about um, right now, which is probably one of the more important things is marketing, branding, and social media. So like, what are you guys doing to kind of stay on top of that? And do you have a team that, that takes care of that? And Yeah, so we have a whole marketing team. Um, 
We have a team down in Charleston, and then we have a team in New York. Um, I play a pretty big part on our team here in New York, specifically at Downtown Social. Um, there's five people on our team plus myself. Um, I try to just be as present as possible when it comes to our social media. What's going on? Um, I'll have conversations with our other operators. It's like, great, you put a post up a month ago. I don't understand it. I don't know what's going on. So how do we make it as easy as possible for customers to understand what's happening in our building? Um, we do a lot of live content. I feel pretty strongly about that. Um, you know, there's not an immediate return on that. And it takes up a lot of my time during the night. But when I get texts or, you know, your DJs or friends text you guys like, oh, my God, downtown social looked electric tonight or what's going on? My spot's dead. Um, there's some social status there that's important to the success of our business. When people can see on a dead Friday night in New York City that we have a line around the block and, you know, I, I use chaos a lot in in our marketing and it's just like, what the hell is going on in that building? I need to see this for myself. Yeah. Yeah. And just organized going back chaos. to I think the little things, organized chaos or unorganized. Um <laughs> messaging different people you know the, the the girl or guy who had a bad night step taking a step with them outside giving them some free drink cards giving them my card you know text me next time you're here i'll take care of you that's like real boots to the ground stuff that i think people say you know it's 10 p.m the night's kicked off i can sit back and you know just be crowd control at this point your night's just getting started how how can i make as many customers nights as i can by physically being there for them yeah, it, you you're doing something on a nightly basis that I feel like some ownership is doing only on the big days. I think your focus every Friday and Saturday is to make sure every customer can become a repeat customer. Yeah. And it's something that I am hearing more and more only on SantaCon, Halloween bar crawl, Halloween uh Saturday night. You know, and I and I hear need your best DJ in here tonight. Like and it's like, I'll pay a couple more dollars for, on this day. It's like, well, why aren't you just paying a couple more dollars every weekend and just creating the best possible experience you can for your venue every week? Yep. And, you know, and, and that's the day that the, maybe the owner shows up and he's not there every Saturday night and he's trying to be involved with the, with the crowd. And it's like you, you're, you can't do this five nights a year. You know, you have to do it every Friday and Saturday. And it's it's really what makes the difference. I mean, that's the root of hospitality. Yeah. Making people have fun, feel important. Um, back to the DJs and packages. Yeah. We don't have an infinite budget, you know. Uh, nobody does. Right. But if we can pay the DJs what they're paying them and they still want to come and they want to perform and they want me to come up at the end of the night and – give him a big hug. I'm like, guys, you crushed it. And I throw you guys in a group chat being like, this is the best that I've ever heard. That is where that excess pay comes from. Yeah. The venues that are doing the best are the ones that have either a managing partner or an owner that's involved and care about hospitality. I mean, I'm thinking in my head, I'm not going to call all the places out, but the venues that have someone who's sort of the face and cares and is interacting with customers on a weekly basis and everyone associates downtown social with Chris and everyone associates the Ashford with Connor and so on wicked wolf with Slav. Like when, when you have a, a face of a venue and you have someone that cares about the customer experience to me, your venue is going to be successful. I guarantee you that the places that have that person, the numbers are going to look better than all the places that don't. And you brought up like, this is simple, it's hospitality, but not a lot of people are doing it, Chris. It's crazy to me. We're in the hospitality industry and no one wants to provide this high-end hospitality experience. It's, it blows my mind. And, and that's one of the big reasons why I feel like, one of the reasons, but why our industry is sort of on a little bit of a, a, a downside right now and not as many people are going out because it's like, there is no hospitality in many places. They just, yeah. people are just running a business and going about the day to day and they don't care. And I see it all the time in the service when I go to restaurants, you know, at bars with, with bartenders who are on their phones and not looking at taking care of customers. Like it happens in 75% of the places I'd say. It's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. It, you, you shake your head. 
you look at it and you shake your head because you know that guy's putting five days in the office and to not have a team member pay attention to the most important part of our business, it's throwing that all away. Yeah. Those little things like you talked about, like grabbing somebody, giving them their card, pulling them outside, having a quick conversation, people remember that stuff. And when they're like, oh, what should we do tonight? That person's going to say, oh, we should go to downtown because they had such a great experience the last time. That makes all the difference. It's very simple. And I don't understand why it gets, it's so complicated and diluted, but like yeah. give your customers a good time and, you know, like take care of them and they're going to come back. <laughs> Something I preach to my team, um, when you have a good customer, everyone has in their head that we need to hone in on this good customer because they're so good to us, which it is important. I think what's even more important is being good to the customers who maybe are not the best to us. An example I have is I was standing outside the other month and this couple walked by and they laughed that we had a line and it's, this place sucks. And I, I grabbed them. I said, hey, guys, can I come buy you a drink inside real quick? Made them skip the line, brought them on the DJ stage. They had confetti. They've been in every week for the last three months. <laughs> <laughs> that, that opportunity, you know, that people have a negative connotation of what your business is, that's an opportunity to turn a customer and for them to now go home and say, I never thought I'd say this, but downtown social was the most fun I've had in New York City. Um, and it's letting go of your ego of turning around and being like, you don't know what you're talking about or, you know, get the hell out of here. Um, yeah. It goes a long way, especially in a jaded city like New York, you know. The amount of people who walk out and there's an altercation or something happens and they're coming out heated and I'm standing out there. I'm like, let's talk. How you doing? What happened? You know, I don't know what happened, but I'm just, I'm here to, I'm here to figure this out. People don't get that because people are so up on their high horse about we're so good. And this is our venue and don't mess with us. You know, your doors will be closed in two months if you constantly think like that. Yeah. Such a great outlook. Man. It's a, having that positive outlook and being able to flip the customers. I, I love hearing it. It's hard to do, man. It's and not, most people in those situations are defensive and are like, well, F them, like, fuck them. I don't need them as a customer. But I think that's just like the natural reaction. And to be able to have that positive mind state and trying to convert them, it's like such a great opportunity for, for you and for your, your venues. So that's super cool to hear. Well, it's getting back to the long-term versus short-term success. We do need those customers because if we start losing customers in the short term, how do we expect to keep them in the long term? Right. Um, again, it's putting that ego aside and just understanding what your customer wants and making them feel important. There's also a shelf life for your customers too, right? Like there's only so many years that you're going to, that a regular is going to be going out and being a regular at some point, they're probably not going to go out as much, or they're going to get married and have kids, or they're going to move away. And like, you have that window of time to have those people as customers. So you need to constantly be building the next regulars, you know? Those current regulars need to be talking to the younger generations how positive their experience is so they come back. You know, yeah. so their younger cousins come back and then their younger brother comes back and it's a constant cycle and your venue can stay where your venue is for as long as possible. Love it, man. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else we haven't talked about or you want to cover or go over? I feel like we uh, we hit a lot today. I'm trying to DJ. I try to DJ t the last 10 minutes of every set, and it is <laughs> awful. It is so bad. <laughs> uh, it's My appreciation for what you guys do has, has, has really been brought to the next level. But my goal is to DJ bathroom breaks uh, on a Saturday night and nobody notice. How uh... – how nerve wracking is it when you're trying to mix two songs together and you got to hit like seven different knobs and buttons at the same time? It's a lot. Uh, I find myself getting, you know, really focused on what's in, in the headphones, um, physically and metaphorically. Um, and you forget what's happening in the room. So, yeah, like I said, the, my appreciation for that is, has grown. We'll get you there. Slow we'll and get steady. You there. <laughs> I'll see you Friday, man. Well, I'll have to uh, throw you into the fire. I'll, I'll, I'll take a little bathroom run. <laughs> Get a little crate ready for me for the last 10 minutes. Give me some, some stuff right. to work with. We could do that for sure. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, yeah, that's all I got, guys. Like You guys know my appreciation for you is, is more than I can put into words. Uh, 
you know, I feel like my venue uh, and myself has has been brought to the next level having you guys as part of our team. Um, and I'd, I'd like to think vice versa. Um, I think we've both learned a lot working together in the last year. And I'm excited percent. to see what the next year is going to entail. It's going to be good. Yeah, we know that much. It's been it's been uh, it's been nice to have another business owner who kind of gets it and is in our world to have high level conversations, whether it's has to do with downtown or get down or not. And uh, so I always appreciate those conversations and uh, I look forward to more of them. We got to do a meetup. Get down at downtown. Yeah, we do have to do that. We will. Yeah. Get down meetup Man. coming early 2024. We got to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, possibly. All cool, right. man. All right, Chris. Chris appreciate Kindle. You. Appreciate you. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Peace. All right, guys. Peace. See you guys. Thanks for listening to the Get Down Podcast. If you enjoy our show and find the topics entertaining or helpful in any way, we would greatly appreciate if you could subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you listen to it. We want to help more DJs, and subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show is the best way for us to do that. We appreciate all the love so far. Thanks for listening, guys.